welcome everybody. Susan said, I'm Vas Vasiliadis with the Globus team. Before I jump into this, just fair warning that we may get some uh, unintended noise in the background, but we'll just work through that. So first off, just a couple of words about who Globus is. We're actually a group at the University of Chicago and we develop and operate this research data management service on behalf of the broader community. Our mission is really to make data management and data-driven science in general much more efficient and to do so in a sustainable way. So we do have uh, the service used in over 80 countries. In fact, we are celebrating our 10 year anniversary this year. We launched the service at SC10 uh, in New Orleans. So we're excited to, to hit this really important milestone. Development of the service gets funded by grants from a lot of the federal agencies but it's particularly important for sustainability purposes uh, that we rely on our subscribers who, who pay us annual subscriptions to uh, operate the service. So um, a big shout out to, to all of those that do subscribe and hoping to have more of you join that list. So I wanna walk through very briefly just some of the common use cases that we see with Globus. At the core, we have a reliable file transfer service. This has been used extensively in all sorts of scientific and other research domains. And this is the ability to just move files between any two storage systems that have what we call Globus endpoints on them. And I'll talk briefly about what that is in a bit. So that includes Wasabi endpoints as well as uh, many other types of storage systems. Very importantly, because research is inherently collaborative, we have the ability to share data with users that don't have local accounts or local account or access to that local storage system or to the, to the cloud buckets or what have you. Uh, but you can grant selective access with fine grained security access control to users outside of your organization, perhaps within your collaboration or within the broader community. And as the instruments that are coming online, such as next-gen sequencers and cryo ENs and so on, become more and more high-res. They're generating tens of terabytes of data. So this is a very common use case where we're seeing the need to automate the ability to pull data off these instruments in a reliable way, put it onto storage systems for compute, archive it, share it with others, and so on. And then downstream, we're seeing uh, many groups developing portal science gateways, data commons, and other ways to expose or make this, these data sets uh, more widely uh, findable and accessible, both uh, with the ability to, to browse and download them through, through, uh, through a web browser, and also to do the more bulk uh, managed file transfer out of band, as I'm showing here on the right. And of course, we are at supercomputing, so many folks are running HPC workloads or other high throughput uh, compute jobs. And so the ability to stage data in and out around a compute job is critical. So we enable that through our Globus command line interface. As I mentioned, Globus works around the system of endpoints. So an endpoint is a storage system that has the Globus Connect software installed along with the Globus for Wasabi connector. So we do have uh, a connector for Wasabi as well as many other systems. So it allows you to move data from this diverse set of, of storage systems into your Wasabi buckets uh, and to do so reliably uh, and, and, and fast because uh, fast is in our DNA. Thanks, Maz. Hi, everybody. My name is David, and I'm on our product marketing team here at Wasabi, as Susan said. And I just want to spend the next two or three minutes talking a little bit about Wasabi, who we are, and how we help you unlock the power of your data. Um, there is, a, you know, it's no, it, it's no secret that the data is the most important asset in almost any research endeavor these days. And and that, you know, data is not a commodity. My data is not the same as Vaz's data or Sue's data. Each day, everyone's data should be treated as unique. It's, it's almost every case that data will be unique to your organization and your ability to discover uses for the data uh, helps you differentiate you and your resource. Getting access to your data in a timely fashion is of course critically important. I am sure that many of you have to subscribe for time and apply for time on uh, supercomputing infrastructure. Uh, and to be able to stage your data 
prior to your allocated time is critically important. And you know how you get your data, I mean, it could be from instruments, could be next-gen instruments like Vaz had mentioned, the cryo EM or uh, next-gen sequencers. Uh, you know, that data should be readily available. And unfortunately, all too often, it's not. I've talked to uh, plenty of researchers out there that actually found that the cost to store data uh, outweighs their ability to just to run the research again and generate new data. So what they end up doing is running their research multiple times, you know, prior to staging it so that uh, they don't have to spend a lot of money on the storage of data. Not that storing it is a, a bad idea, it's just expensive. And uh, you get to a point where you will want to have easy access to that data. And if you're storing the data, many of us you know, have used LTO tape in the past or something that's offline, that's not readily, readily accessible to networks because it's been inexpensive. And, uh, and there's still a lot of data out there in those LTO libraries. And getting that into a, into a hot cloud storage solution where that is readily accessible is, is something that's gonna be critically important going forward. Vaz, we're gonna to go to the next slide because what happens is the more data you can run your analytics on or your research on or crunch, you know, use the supercomputer cores on, the more reliable the results are gonna be. So the challenge of data management, of course, is storage cost. Uh, and having to make the, the decision of whether you store your data or delete it. And uh, nobody wants to delete uh, that data anymore. Now, accessing the data and staging it prior to, you know, running the research on it or using the super supercomputing uh, resources is critically important. These days, we've found that a lot of researchers have kept their data, especially for research projects, offline. And if it's in an offline facility, it takes a long time to get to. And even these days, you know, due to COVID and in a, it, people being in, unable to access that data has caused a major problem for some of the research that uh, we've seen. Right? And then of course, if it's not kept online, if it's not readily available on, I would say in the cloud storage, you have a, a risk of data loss. And as I mentioned earlier, loss, you know, data is unique to your organization. And uh, if you don't have that data to run analytics on or to run your research on, then you really uh, you rerun the risk of taking longer to get to market with your, with your results. It's, um, it's no secret these days that artificial intelligence is a better, uh, does a better job of identifying medical ailments like breast cancer than humans do. And that's because, um, for the last two decades, people have been donating and storing um, x-rays and, uh, and researchers have been able to take those decades worth of, of x-rays and research and compile algorithms and run research on them to identify, you know, breast cancer and other ailments quicker than, than a, your, your, your oncologist can. And so all that data being locked up in a place where it is inaccessible, you know, would have, you know, prolonged the ability to get the, the treatments to market and help people identify elements. Now, these days we see a lot more uh, data being generated uh, by artificial intelligence and machine learning and next generation instruments. We see autonomous devices out there. Um, it could be anything from environmental sensors to, uh, to you know, city centers, to uh, IoT on manufacturing lines, in internet of things and devices on manufacturing lines. All of those are creating data. And all that data can be used you know, to run analytics on or to crunch you know, in the supercomputer somewhere. And that needs to be stored where it's readily accessible. Not offline, someplace that you can afford. So there's where Wasabi comes in. Right? Wasabi differentiates, differentiates ourselves from other cloud storage uh, uh, options because of price, performance, and protection. Price from a pricing perspective, uh, cloud object storage, deep archive storage, you know, deep storage for archives or for, uh, I would call, you know, hot data even, you know, it's less expensive in Wasabi than it will be elsewhere, right? And all you will be, you know, charged for is the, is the storage charge, right? There's no egress charge. There's no API request charge. I don't expect scientists and researchers to be storage admins. They shouldn't have to worry about storage. They should just worry about the projects that they're working on and have storage available to them in the background. And they shouldn't have to worry about where they're, uh, where they're being nickel and dimed 
from the resource perspective, pricing goes. So no egress charges for Wasabi to put your data into the Wasabi Cloud Storage. No egress charges to get your data out of uh, that storage. There's no request charges to every time you put an object or a file or a research project up into the cloud, you don't have to worry about an API put requests and get requests and inventory requests. It's, it's, it's something that you as a research scientist don't have to worry about. From a, a performance perspective, it's readily available. You know, milliseconds away, the data sits. It's, just, it's a, at the speed of human, actually. As fast as you can move your mouse is about as fast as you can get your data back. You don't have to worry about being off-site in a, an LTO tape and a salt mine in Utah someplace. You don't have to worry about being in, a, in an archive tier somewhere in the cloud where it takes half a day to get that research information back to you. It's available at the click of a button. And from a protection perspective, it's, it's just as, as secure, possibly more secure than many offline situations, right? So full data center redundancy on Wasabi's part, we do have 11 nines of data durability, which means that if you're storing 10 million objects in a Wasabi bucket, we might lose one object you know, every, every 100 years or so. It, it's, it's, uh, the data durability is something that can't be, can't be beat elsewhere. And then uh, something you don't have to worry about, but available in the background is immutable storage. If you need to have uh, to, uh, reassurance that your data will never be compromised, never be held for ransom, never be um, uh, suffer from bit rot or any kind of uh, um, uh, malice, immutable storage is an option for you where you can set immutability on your bucket and the data that sits in that bucket can never be altered. So price, performance, protection, that's what uh, separates Wasabi from other cloud options. Baz? Thank you, David. So without getting too technical, I just want to talk very briefly about how the joint solution is deployed. As I mentioned previously, we use these things called endpoints. So typically this is structured as one or more data transfer nodes that have the Globus Connect server software installed along with the Globus for Wasabi connector. And that then acts as a gateway to the buckets on uh, Wasabi Cloud. And from the user perspective, they come along via one of the many Globus UIs, the web app or a command line interface, or even through the REST API, and they access the data through these things called collections, and they can move them and share them as I described previously. And so what does this really mean for you as a researcher? It means that you can access Wasabi storage the same way that you access any other Globus enabled storage. It's just like browsing your data on your desktop, um, just through, um, you know, an explorer or finder, what have you, familiar interface. Uh, very importantly, you can reliably migrate really big data sets. We've seen petascale movement uh, of data with Globus fairly routinely, uh, reliably uh, to, to hot storage on Wasabi Cloud. And uh, we also deal with things like API rate limits. So if you're moving from a service that limits how fast you can pull data off to send it up to Wasabi, Globus will just handle that so you can just focus on getting uh, your work done. And at the end of the day, the ability to share with very fine-grained access control, as I mentioned previously, is really critical uh, in research settings. And uh, you can do that um, with Wasabi as you can with many other storage systems that we support under Globus. And so with that, I'll put up some links for people to follow up on and uh, open it up to questions. Thank you.